Good morning, and um, can I be the first to welcome James Melville uh, to Camelot Castle? Now, James, just so you know, uh, is probably becoming, uh, in recent months, one of the foremost uh, opinion formers, I would say, within the British media. Uh, he has an incredibly powerful uh, Twitter group and uh, various different uh, social media groups. And I was very, James, thank you. Can I just say thank you so much for inviting me into your extremely erudite uh, My pleasure, John. team. And, and uh, of course, Camelot Castle is becoming a place where freedom of speech is being upheld. And uh, I always say this at the beginning of a, of, of a television broadcast, this is a buyer beware network. So if you hear... Uh, something that you don't agree with. Um, if you want to be told what to think, go and watch the BBC or ITV, or uh, I used to say go and watch Piers Morgan, but of course we can't say that anymore. Um, <laughs> uh, wait, well, well, let's start with that. What did you think of Piers? What, what, what is your position on Piers' uh, uh, resignation? I think with, um, you know, everyone's entitled to their opinion on a number of different issues, and he's certainly entitled to, to his. You know, he claims to be a champion of freedom of speech, which is, and some of the comments he says around that are, are valid by itself, if you stand it by itself. But then to to flounce off his own show because someone was coming up with an alternative view undermines his original argument. So, but he's box office, he splits opinion, and he's not going to go away, is he? It'd be not interesting to see away. what his next move is. He's not going away. And I think the point is, is that... Um, you have, uh, he, he's a Marmite character. I don't know if you saw his Instagram. He had this guy who, who painted it, painted him in Marmite, uh, which, of course, I would say this is the Marmite Hotel. So I, I completely understand that. But then, you know, every, and there's an argument that any influencer is Marmite. It reminds me of the famous Ricky Gervais um, commentary recently, whereby he said, if you've got an opinion that's even marginally to the right, then you're considered to be, you know, worse than Hitler. If you've got a comment slightly to the left, you're seen as a troll. And if you're in the middle, then the left and the right think that you're selling out. So mm. if you've got a lot of followers, if mm. you've got a voice with those followers and an opinion, and I consider my opinions to be moderate and liberal and about balance and fairness, you're still not going to please everyone. No. So I could put whatever opinion I want to put on social media, and I'm sure you're the same there's always going to be someone who disagrees with it. But my thing is about the form of disagreement, about being respectful and actually calling someone out with a bit of decorum is fine. Challenge should challenge the other person. But I've got no time for the trollings and the abuse. And I've certainly got no time for, to go back to the freedom of speech aspect, cancel mm. culture, no. which comes from all directions, but it's not healthy for, for good debate. Yeah. Well, you know, we, we've had a nice chat this morning. We had a nice mm -hmm. breakfast together. We and, did. Thank and, you for that. And uh, uh, Camelot Castle breakfast, so fantastic. Which I completely recommend, by the way. Good, good. good. Coffee in particular. Best coffee in Cornwall. That's what they say. So, um, first off, how can people follow you on Twitter? Because maybe some people on here already are following you. But how can how can you be followed on Twitter? Yeah, go to my um, Twitter feed. Um, it's uh, James Melville, um, and I like to haver, as I put it from a Scottish vernacular point of view, about a number of different topics. Um, whether that is to do with um, British politics, American politics, but in particular, um, at the moment, my focus is largely driven around um, what I think are some draconian restrictions um, over COVID. And a, as, a, as a liberal and a believer in liberalism, um, I feel that the way the country is going at the moment is diametrically opposite to, mm. to what I want for the country, which is basically a moderate, liberal, compassionate country. So, yes, follow me just at James Melville on Twitter. Yeah. And, and, and I have to say, I've been following James now for the best part of six months. And it's a very, very uh, erudite read. And, it, and some of the people who, you know, are listening to you now, it's very, very interesting. I've even seen, uh, you know, government policy shifts have come a, uh, about directly as a result of some of your communication. You can actually see date coincident. So we are honoured today to be in, uh, to have the opportunity to talk to you. And there are certain key issues 
that I know that you wanted to communicate yeah. about. Um, in particular, the consequences of lockdown. Um, and I, I don't know what your opinions are out there as our audience, but I would really like to hear what you what you have to say about that, because specifically in relation to children. I think there's a context here, going back to the start. My position has evolved throughout this crisis. You can see articles that I've written right at the start of the COVID crisis back in March and April, whereas I was advocating harsh lockdown straight away, clean it out, therefore we could get a testing, tracking, tracing model in place. But as the summer went on, my opinions moved because there was data coming from, from other countries. We started looking at, for instance, the Sweden model. And I actually received a lot of online criticism for saying so we needed to start looking at what Sweden are doing, where they didn't, just, they didn't let it rip, as some of the lockdowners would say. They actually had a balanced approach where they were, they were closing their borders, but shielding the vulnerable groups, the elderly, but keeping their working economy going. Um, and yet their COVID charts, or in terms of cases, in terms of hospitalizations, in terms of deaths, is actually very similar to the UK, which has gone a different path, which has been long-term lockdowns and therefore the damage that's attached to those lockdowns. So Sweden's economy has remained largely robust throughout all of this, and Swedish citizens have kept most of their freedoms. We, on the other hand, and this is my thing about the British approach, is we've got the worst of all worlds. We've got an ongoing health crisis. It's a health crisis in two ways. The overall figures for COVID deaths, which are a major concern. We should never lose sight of that. That's at the core of the, the whole issue. But we also have the other part of the health crisis, and that is non-COVID. Um, deaths, um, non-COVID delays in treatment. So we've been running at a thousand excess home deaths almost every week since the start of this crisis. That is something that needs to be discussed. We also have um, delays in uh, non-COVID treatments where we have now four and a half million people on waiting lists for treatments, non-COVID treatments. That has to be discussed. And then we've also got the economic damages in terms of uh, business bankruptcies, we also have job losses. We have economic decline in terms of figures in 2020 worse than at any time since records began. That has to be discussed. We also have issues about kids' mental health, as you touched on, whereby we now have an additional 500,000 kids who require mental health treatment since this crisis started. That has to be discussed. We also have a discussion that has to be had about what the elderly actually want to do when mental health issues for the elderly have gone to the roof. So we've got all these areas that I would classify as collateral damage. And my biggest concern with this is through government, politicians, and our media, these areas that I've talked about are not getting the same platform as the direct issues with COVID itself. If you're going to talk about COVID, I'm no COVID denier. It's a major problem. But I do not want to deny discussing COVID in the round. COVID, but also the collateral damages of COVID as well. Mm. So so what do you, you know, think that, I mean, we've got a lot of people watching mm -hmm. here who are sitting at home and they want to do something about this. They want to make their opinions heard. Um, what should somebody do in terms of, because you're quite, sort of, a lot of people uh, come to James, by the way, James has a social media and a communications consultancy business. He actually advises, if I'm allowed to say, the project, the big garden project you did down here. Yeah, I've done, well, I've done work with a number of clients, uh, both locally down here, nationally, uh, and overseas as well. Um, and I advise them on, you know, not not just communications, but on, on branding, on sponsorship. Um, and what I work with some of the biggest names in Cornwall. Uh, yeah, I, I have done over the years, and so I've worked a number of different projects, but. What I would advise anyone who wants to, who's got an opinion, is to, is to, as long, you know, opinions are too sick. There's, there's the wrong type of opinions that basically shut people down or abusive. I've got no time for that. But if you've got an opinion that is either something that you want to say or question or scrutinize or find, just find out more information or just have a voice, that's a good thing. So as a liberal, my whole foundation of my political beliefs are twofold about protecting those who need it most at all times but about our freedoms of movement, of expression, of speech, that can never be shut down. And I, I sense with a, not just COVID, but just in terms of a cultural point of view or a social point of view, 
we're in this space now where if someone has a different opinion, that doesn't make them a bad person. That makes them an interesting person. I love having political debates with people with different opinions. But there's well, a cancel mean. culture that seems to be suppressing alternative views. It's not extreme views, it's just different views, and that is fundamentally wrong. Well, I think it is important, and I think the sharing of ideas is yeah. so British and is so important to British culture. And the danger of cancel culture, of course, is that people who otherwise would perhaps originate a helpful idea decide, well, actually, you know what, I'll just keep that idea to myself. Completely. I think it's about being transparent. Yeah. It's about actually showing an element of vulnerability through having an opinion. But I'm concerned that a lot of people feel disenfranchised from expressing an opinion because they're worried about the pile on, they're worried about the trolling, they're worried about the bullying, and that's not good. So I've experienced on social media, which is a consequence of having a lot of followers and being opinionated, um, all kinds of abuse on social media. Now, I'm pretty thick-skinned, so I can, I can take all that. But I know people who also have large followings, and they might not be equipped to deal with that sort of um, abuse online. And so a big part of what I've tried to put out on social media as well is about you can have a different opinion, but it doesn't make you a bad person. You can have different opinions and be friends with people with different opinions. So, for instance, I got a lot of trolling about a year ago when I happened to put out pictures and say that a lot of my close friends and members of my family are Brexiters. I'm a Remainer. And there was people coming and saying, how, how dare you do that? And basically, who's funding you for these opinions? And what's happened to you, James? Nothing's happened to me. It's what I've always thought. If we all had debates with people who were completely like-minded, we'd be sitting in this very unhealthy echo chamber, reaching out to cross over opinions, learn from other people, um, and form friendships with different people with different opinions is a healthy thing. And it's good for the basically localized conversations, individual conversations, and the national conversation as well. Well, I think you're, you're absolutely right. And I've certainly learned a lot by, by being part of your group. Um, and I would advise everybody on here to follow James Melville. We don't agree on everything. For instance, I was a Brexiteer. And although, um, I, you know, I love Europe and I, I definitely see the benefit of, of the, the one argument that I, I, you know, my grandfather fought in the First World War. Yeah. And the one argument that I always understood was that the idea that if people are trading together, then they're not fighting each other. Um, but um, we, 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 we probably don't agree on everything, but I think one of the things we do agree on is the collateral damage of uh, the lockdown. And I personally, I don't think anybody knew how to deal with this in the beginning. I, I don't particularly, uh, you know, even though I joke about Boris, I'm not uh, particularly critical of, 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 of what he's done in the beginning. Now, with the data that is in, and the fact that, you know, I had uh, a lady came here the other day and she'd been out in the woods two days before with a pile of pills and she was going to commit suicide. And she would have left behind two children. Thankfully, she changed her mind. Another friend uh, had had a, had a friend who, his child of eight, had herself harmed himself and then in the end committed suicide. The number of child suicides, and I would love to see the official suicide figures because I don't believe we're being presented them. They've been delayed for a start. I mean, it's, I mean, they will come out, but there's a lag in those numbers. So we're, we're looking at, at the moment, estimates from mental health charities, um, also in terms of um, localised information and so on. But I agree, I think the mental health crisis is a major part of that and has to mm. be discussed. And it comes back to the point I said, John, that if we're going to talk about COVID, mm. we talk about the COVID curves in terms of hospitalizations and death rates, of course, but we've got issues that are Very hugely deep. significant that need equal coverage. Mental health being one of them, the state of the economy, which is obviously linked in at times to mental health, and then non-COVID treatment delays as well. Well, I have been fascinated by the entire subject of mental health since about 1990, because as I mentioned to you, I came across a cure for depression in America, and I have been involved in promoting that cure. And what is extraordinary to me is how hard it is to actually get actual information about a simple drug-free cure to depression that works 100% of the time, um, but, you know, providing a person doesn't hasn't had a lobotomy or something, or that there's no physical impairment of the mind. Um, 
But, of course, what we have to realise, and I don't know if you'd like to speak to this, is that there is huge money being made by people selling antidepressants. And there isn't necessarily a motivation from those lobbies to reduce the amount of depression. In fact, you could argue that there is a motivation from pharma to increase the amount of depression. Yeah, I mean, I think there's, you know, my, my view on this is about, it's actually kind of a holistic approach. It's almost turning that on its head. So we should be looking at ways where there's, you know, like a, again, developing a national conversation about well-being. So about in terms of maintenance of physical fitness links into to mental well-being. So for instance, about exercise problems, community schemes, so you can you can keep fit, right patterns of eating, diet, um, you know, processes that you can do to stimulate your mind, um, the, the whole aspect of socializing, tactile behavior, which has been stripped out, obviously, during the pandemic. That again, there should be a conversation about all aspects of, of well-being. So... Mm. You know, people do get in patterns, and I've, you know, I've seen people, individuals who I'm close to have had problems over the years, not just even in the current crisis with mental health issues. So um, there needs to be discussion about how to address that, rather than just kind of the elastoplast approach. Let's look at all aspects to improve our mental health of all ages. And I think one of hopefully one of the legacies of COVID is we start having this joined up conversation about how do we improve the well-being of the country generally. Mm. I mean, I would be interested to see the statistic of uh, um, antidepressant prescription over the last 12 months and yeah. whether or not that has increased. And I'd like to see how much additional profits the pharmaceutical companies that are manufacturing those antidepressants have made. And I think it would be quite startling numbers. Um, I mean, in any crisis, you know, the words key bono, who benefits? Um, I have found to be very, very interesting. And as a journalist in me says, you know, you always follow the money. You look at who is going to benefit here. And the same was true of, you know, uh, Watergate. Um, we're joined by a lot of new people here. And um, this is, somebody's just asked, have just joined this conversation, who is John chatting with? We are joined today uh, with James Melville. James Melville, you can follow him on Twitter, at James Melville, is that correct? At James Melville, that's right. Um, so I've been on Twitter for a few years now, but obviously the engagement's gone up over the last few years, in particular some of the um, conversations I've been having, engagement over a number of um, political issues. Um, so come and follow me, join yeah, the James, debate. James is a, a very well-known television and radio personality. Um, he is also an advisor to many large corporations in Cornwall. He handles their uh, media messaging and their comms and uh, works with a number of major corporations. He is a very, what I would call, high-level uh, consultant. Um, and probably there's a lot of people that you do consult that you don't talk about. Um, but certainly some of the names that he's mentioned to me that he, he can. Yeah, um, I mean, all of that is going to be... You know, I, I, I work with a number of um, organizations, not just in Cornwall, but across the country. Uh, but, um, organizations that I find um, share the same values, they're ethical, um, they like to have a conversation, they like to develop good models of social responsibility. Um, and that's, you know, it's not just the companies I work with in my business, it's about what I try and reflect as an individual through my opinions. That, I'm, as I said a couple of times earlier, a liberal to the core. And what I want is to have, you know, individuals, communities, um, regions across the country, the country itself, to basically come together and heal through this crisis and, and develop this sort of community spirit whereby people are connecting in the right way and actually offering um, the sort of future that people can actually grasp and feel confident about again. Because one of the problems we've got in this crisis is, understandably, the huge amounts of fear. Fear in terms of health, but also fear of the future, because the future at the moment seems very unknown and unwritten for a lot of people. And we need to have that conversation about what does Britain look like beyond COVID. And at the moment, it comes back to the elastoplast approach. We're dealing with what's in front of us, which is to an extent understandable. But there's not a conversation about where are we going in terms of our society mm. in this country. Have you have you considered uh, running uh you know, in politics, have you considered being an MP? Or, or, I've thought I've thought about it a couple of times, but I, at the moment in my life, you know, I, 
I have a sense of balance. I have a sense of family life. I have a sense of my business running well. I have various interests outside that. I have um, old family in Scotland um, and live in Cornwall, so I'm moving between the two quite a bit. So at the moment, I'm happy with the variety in my life. I mean, I, I wouldn't rule it out, um, mm. but I'm involved in politics in a way anyway through the commentary that I do. Of course you are, yeah. And so I, I mean, like uh, seeing things by almost taking a step back from the thing, going, is this right, is this isn't right? I'd like to have a conversation with people about various things and have a commentary. Um, so at the moment, I see it from very much of, I have my opinions mm. as my role within politics. Well, you see, I think that... Um, uh, you know, in politics today, one tends to get bound to a political party, and then once you're part of that party, Which, you're 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 subservient to the whip, aren't you? Yeah, I mean, I've been members of political parties in the, in, in the past. I've, I've, you know, I'm sympathetic to some of them, but that depends on the time. But I, I increasingly, I, I I take the view that I don't buy into this tribalism. I put a video out on my Twitter feed about six months ago about the perils of toxic tribalism. And it comes back to the point that I touched on earlier about it is possible to have respectful debate and form friendships with people with different political opinions. You know, there's obviously ext wild extremes that there's some repugnant views and everyone's got their red lines on how far they develop a relationship with a different opinion. But I do think the toxic tribalism in this country is causing more division. Mm. It seems that everything becomes like a turf war between sides. So whether it's Remain versus... Brexit, whether it's people versus police now, whether it's to do with lockdown or anti-lockdown, everyone's taking a side. And actually, the the debate should be a lot more nuanced and free-flowing than that. So we can have our opinions, but it's, it, I find it really, really healthy when someone says something, and I think there's something in that, and you go, do you know what? That's a really good point. Mm -hmm. I don't know enough about it at the moment, but I'm going to go away and read up on it or think about it. And then we can have a debate again. Mm. And that, I like that agility, well, you not see, set opinions. Yeah, well, you see, you are a true knight of the round table because, of course, <laughs> what we say here is that the table was round for a reason. Yeah. And, and of course, funnily enough, people don't realise this, but the round table was actually created during a period of, uh, in the Dark Ages, where nobody in England was basically getting on. And Merlin the magician came up with the idea of the round table to basically get people round the table communicating don't put the king at the head uh, and as a sort of a dictatorial structure but have him listen to his courtiers and of course the round table was essentially a communications tool yeah which I mean, is really what you've what you've created so it's highly appropriate that you're here today and um, uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to say about our little gathering here in June um, but uh, we will have uh, a convocation of freedom thinkers occurring. I better not give the date just in case we get raided. But uh, basically the free speakers and the free thinkers of England are are going to be uh, joining us really. And uh, obviously with, Scotland as well. And Scotland as well. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 I put my foot in it there. Well, of course, um, Scotland is has been very tough on the lockdown. Yeah, it has. And I think, you know, it comes back to that thing where there's almost different stages. And at the start, I agree with your point, John, earlier, that at the start, no one knew what was going on. No. And so there's an element of sympathy to, you know, governments making mistakes at that time. But, you know, governments everywhere made huge errors, for instance, on things like PPE and in terms of the contracts around that and, and taxpayers, public money being thrown, spaffed away on various procurement contracts, which is an issue. And, and again, it needs to be discussed. And then, well, I mean, it does seem to me as if a lot of these contracts have gone to people's friends. Quite possibly. I mean, I think this will all come out possibly in the wash someday, but what what needs to happen is that there's a lot of lessons that need to be learned from this. Um, we've done things... There's been so many misplaced um, mistakes in terms of all different... Whether it's PPE, whether it's to do with the timings of the lockdowns, whether it's to do ignoring the collateral damages. And like, for instance, in the summer last year where... Government and NHS bought up two thirds of the private sector, um, and it was sitting empty at a cost of one point eight billion. And at that time, a reconnaissance period last summer, um, our hospitals, the COVID rates were low last summer, and yet the backlog of non-COVID treatments was stacking up. 
and get, that wasn't utilised. And then you've got the whole model where the nightingales, which were developed at great cost, and then a lot of them not even used. And then, so, are we going to learn from those mistakes last summer and into this winter, this summer and next winter? Because to do it once is bad, but to do it again would be appalling. So that's my concern as well, that we, we do see what's worked and what hasn't worked, but we have to make sure that what hasn't worked, whether it's PPE contracts or the nightingales not being used properly or um, to do with failed models at great expense of um, track and trace, those mistakes can't keep on happening. No, no, it does seem like uh, a few of the decisions that were made. Now, Maria Moyles says, totally agree with what you're saying, James. It seems to me when people are distracted by fractionalisms, uh, factionalisms, that is when the government in the UK tries to sneak in new oppressive laws. Um, you know, this is this is what we've been observing as well. And thank you very much for your your comment, Marie. Um, yeah. You know, we, we we a lot of stuff is being slipped in under the radar, and I don't know if there's been a vote yet on the new police bill. Has there? I think it's. I mean, that's a perfect example whereby, I mean, there's no way of, I think, justifying that. It is authoritarianism no. in its absolute extreme. Mm. And as a liberal, I'm as a whole, liberal, that must be, that must but it's actually, grate every bone in your body, doesn't it? It, it brings a lot of sides together on this one. So mm. there's an irony that a lot of lockdowners are quite, sort of, you know, accepting of the loss of freedoms that we've got at the moment. But on this one, because of the, what I would say is a, now, an iconic moment, um, the scenes and the imagery from what happened on Saturday night at Clapham Common, it's actually made most of people in the country take a step back and go, that isn't acceptable. No. And therefore, what's coming straight after that isn't acceptable. And I think that comes back to my view that the majority of people in this country are moderate liberals. No, well, there are differences. I think we really are a country of Whigs, to be fair. because, And of course, Cornwall is a very, very liberal uh, it is, county. Yeah. Uh, and what people forget, it was the liberals that abolished slavery. It was, it was, um, you know, uh, in fact, uh, the the dinner where it, the Baconic Estate mm-hmm. uh, is where Lord Grenville uh, basically was, and and Wilberforce, and uh, uh, in fact, the the you know the ab- they used to have these abolition pins that were made out of china clay it was mined. Uh, in the where the Eden Project is, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I, that, by by uh, Wedgwood. Wedgwood. I adore that about of... Cornwall. I adore that from where I grew up in Scotland and Fife as well. Both places are, are I would say, tradition. Fi- well, they're traditional freedom fighters. They, they don't take any shit. They, they, yeah, they don't, they don't mess around. I was almost about to swear there, but I'll yeah. say mess around instead. Yeah. Um, but it's about scrutiny, and I was lucky when I grew up. None that, of our viewers swear, by the way. So so. Okay. Just you know, they're they're quite sensitive creatures. Okay, I'll be mild mannered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll think it, but not say it. They're, they're all. And good. so, um, yeah, I mean, I was brought up luckily with a, you know, a state education, but part of that state education, a very good state school in Fife, was uh, debating, was part of the curriculum, and critical thinking was a component that all my teachers used to incorporate within their lessons, and that was developed at Edinburgh University when I did politics as well. So. My family loved the round table political debates, and my family have got wildly different political views. And um, and whenever I go back home, we all sit down, we get some nice wine, and then we have a really good squabble about politics. But it's mm. done with a smile on our face. There's never any resentment, no. and we're tra- what we're trying to do is challenge each other to to scrutinise and also learn. And that's something that I actually like it when someone says to me. And we have the bit, and I realise actually, you're right, mm. and it's actually quite an empowering thing for the other for the other person to to be part of. If and and Twitter doesn't seem to be much of that; it just seems to be like a, basically a battle of opinions and non sequiturs the whole time. And so, instead, going actually, that's a really good point, or I think you might be right, or I'm going to learn about that. Mm. That for me is how debate should be held, and it comes back to. I think one of the pillars of liberalism is about being open to other opinions. I think it's a pillar of Britishness, to be honest with you. That's very true, John. And, and, um, you know, very often, you know, I get these these journalists that come along and and they're always very laudatory in the beginning and then it turns into a a hatchet job. And, you know, I always say to people, you can't do a hatchet job on me, you better go back to hatchet job school. Well, yeah. I mean, one of the things that they, 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 
accuse me of is being eccentric, but um, and they think that's an insult. But actually, being different, um, I think people love us for our differences, not because of our similarities. I think so, and I think it's about not not basically going into the crowd because that crowd who you've always been in goes in a different direction, so therefore you feel an obligation to follow them. Is that surely they can be, you know, it's almost by an issue by issue basis. People need to be sort of looking and assessing what their opinions are, and that comes back to tribalism and sort of particular political party tribes, whereby there's almost a dicta, an unwritten dicta, that everyone should just basically buy into every single policy that a given political party has. And I find that a bizarre concept. It's like, you know, football tribalism is a big thing, and I can understand that people caught, caught up in the in the in the passion of the game and the you know the heritage of supporting a side but that's your team so you follow that team that's very very different to i follow this political part and they've got basically a manifesto stuff full of policies and then everyone going i'll try and sell every one of those policies i, I, I just well, don't believe that you're absolutely right and of course michelle holt uh, who is one of our great viewers, says, agree with everything you're saying, James. Well, so, Michelle, I'm sure if, if you were debating with me, then... She's a lady of great taste. Lady of great taste, let's just say that. But the feeling is mutual. Um, but if you were debating me, you'd find things that you want to squabble with me over as well, because that's just life, and that makes it a good thing. And it's something I put out on my Twitter feed a lot, where I get very, very frustrated about the approach on Twitter where people go, oh, and I've had this recently. When I took this path on scrutinizing lockdowns and talking about the collateral damages, I would have a lot of my followers um, would go, wow, that's an interesting opinion. Can you talk to me about it? And I like that approach. But there was one or two people would come and go, what's happened to you, James? Or <laughs> who's funding you for these opinions? Or um, I'm disappointed in you. What you. So the ownership of opinions... No one should have the right to own someone else's opinion. That's a form of coercive control. Mm. It's a form of gaslighting, and I've got no time for it. Mm. We should respect other people's opinions as long as those opinions are basically moderate, decent opinions. I mean, there's obviously some awful extremes out there, and they should be called out. Mm. But most people have differences. Mm. But mm. those differences are all part of, I think, a modern... Yeah, you're absolutely debate. right. Well, Jane Wright, who is also a regular viewer of ours... She says, there is no debate with current censoring. This is the issue. Opposing voices are not being heard. We are dismissed as nut jobs. I think, yeah, I mean, I've, on the view, been skeptical about lockdowns and also um, concerned about the lack of narrative about the collateral damages of lockdowns. I've been called everything. I've been called COVID denier, COVID idiot, conspiracy theorist, and it's just ridiculous. You know, my views are moderate, maybe slightly left of centre views, mm. but I cherry pick some of those views around the centre ground. And, and I mean, is I've it wrong? Been, is it wrong to demand, as you have been doing, to put attention on the collateral damage of the lockdown and take a holistic approach? Yeah. Is is that, is that an extreme it's, idea? It, it just isn't. I think it's a, back to the cancel culture thing where I take a different view to someone else and some, one or two people will go, let's try and shut that person down because they take a different opinion. But it's, it's a moderate view to say COVID is a problem by itself in terms of obviously deaths and hospitalizations. But we've got a multitude of other problems that are getting worse by the day because of the response to COVID as well. They all need to be discussed mm. and they need to be discussed freely, openly, with respectfulness, but with the attention of detail and evidence to bring out all of these issues around COVID. Because if we just stop all of that, suppress that, and focus just purely on hospitalization, death rates on COVID, and nothing else, that's not a full debate in the round. And my view on any aspect of politics is that there isn't a simplistic black or white. It's far more complicated than all of that. And therefore, good debate brings those nuances out and allow them to be discussed. You know, it, 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 is, um, it is so important. And that's one of the reasons why we started uh, broadcasting here from Camelot on the first evening of the lockdown. And I think we broadcast every night. Of course, what's happened here at Camelot Castle TV is uh, because of we have confronted a number of subjects, this channel has been censored. 
And for those of you that really want to, you know, we do uh, like to share all different viewpoints. And some of them people agree with and some people don't. We have a Telegram channel, Camelot TV Network on Telegram. And I would ask each and every one of you to subscribe to that channel because what I've learned is that on Facebook and on YouTube, you actually have to tell the lesser tale. Um, if you actually give people the full meat and potatoes, sadly, you will be censored. And so from now on, uh, we're going to uh, not be overtly flying in the face of those who wish to censor uh, variant opinion. Um, but what we are going to be doing is asking each and every one of you to sign up to our private TV channel, which we have. I don't have the link for it here, but sign up for the Telegram. Ah, oh, there is the link. Thank you so much. Um, that is the Telegram link. And then we will keep you in touch with any future broadcasts. And also what I'll be doing in that channel is I will be reposting this interview and I'll also put James's um, social media details. Yep. And if there are any companies out there, you could not ask for a better uh, comms uh, or, I would say, consultant, really, to negotiate. Uh, I mean, you've built up your own Twitter following now to about 170. Yeah, I mean, I've used Twitter since 2009, but didn't really use it until um, about 2015, 2016. I'd focused on largely politics. But, yeah, come and look at my Twitter. It's about politics. I, I put a few other things on there particular about Scotland and, yeah. and, and various other interests. So it's quite eclectic. It has a focus on politics, but it has a number of other things. So I'm not just droning on about one particular issue. It's, you know, it's on a multitude of different things. And sometimes we have a bit of fun. There's a lot of engagement on there. I do a lot of writing commentary for a number of different media outlets as well um, on top of my consultancy business. So, yeah, come and follow me. Join the discussion. Um when it is a discussion, but you know, quite often people have different opinions and approach to that in different ways. Yeah, and I've seen how you handle that, and it's very skillful. And for those of you out there going, listen, I just cannot get on with Twitter. I don't understand how to use it. Um, follow James, because he has really a, a good, uh, what I, for want of a better word, a good Twitter technique. Um, Ali Menzi says, the devastating effects of the collateral damage as a result of the restrictions and lockdowns was my first concern 12 months ago. Wow. Well, you were, you see, and this is what we have here at Camelot Castle TV. We have people who actually, on the whole, are very much ahead of the trends. And up, the problem is we are, a lot of us here, what I call awake. And we, we do realize what is going on. And it's very frustrating. I mean, uh, what do you say to somebody like that who knew about this 12 months ago? What do you say? I think... And this is the, what I would say is I think that it's no one really knows. We, all we can do is basically build up our own knowledge based on the evidence that we find and look for the right sort of evidence um, and look for patterns that are emerging. So that's why my big focus is around the collateral damage because that evidence is there. Mm. So it's a, in terms of the, we talked about the mental health issue. We talked about the obvious economic damage or non-COVID treatment delays. That is happening. So it can be discussed. This is not, I don't particularly like crystal ball debating. So, but I think this is not going to work because, and you're basically staring into the future when nothing's actually happened yet. And there's actually elements of the whole Brexit debate that was like that back in 2017 and 18. And I thought at times I approached it the wrong way. It was committed remain. And I was going, this is going to happen. This is going to happen. And no one actually knew. But with COVID, we're, we're in the middle of it. And there are some patterns and trends that have emerged over the last year, in particular on um, the COVID in the round and all the collateral damages. And so but, yeah. we're debating stuff that is literally happening in real time. I think also, and actually I think the Brexit debate is, I think when it first began, you know, because I was part of that debate from the very, very early, even from Jimmy Goldsmith, you know, with his, uh, uh, he created that party, um, the, where they wanted to have the vote. Was it, uh, I forget the, the name of the damn party now, but Jimmy and, and the Aspinalls and, um, you know, Jonathan Aitken, a number of interesting people at the very beginnings of that debate. But with the Brexit, you know, I think the great error that the Brexiteers made is they violated one of the fundamental rules of public relations or campaigning, which is never use lies. 
And that bus that they put out about the NHS, I think that was really crossed a line well, as far as decent people. But I it's, mean, as a Remainer, that must have driven you bananas. It did, yeah. I mean, there was, there was all kinds of disingenuous information, lies, half-truths, whatever, smearing, crystal ball, uh, gazing about what's going to happen. And so the debate became a, you know, a debate of ideology, but not necessarily the facts to back it up because it hadn't actually happened yet. No. Um, we're, so we're now with COVID and actually now beginning to with Brexit, we, we've got more meat in terms of debate because of stats. But like anything else, I learned a few lessons about how I debated the whole Brexit thing at the time. And you know, my whole thing is about to try and find ways where you're bringing people together to bring the best out of people in debate, even if they've got mm. different opinions. Yeah. And, 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 and Stefan says, which I think is very true, differences in viewpoint is a privilege in a society with free speech. Enemies is something different. That's a good way to finish off, I would say. I, I couldn't put it any better myself. So, Stefan, you've come up with the, the quote of the interview. Quote of the interview. But I'm going to ask you one more thing. Let's. We've looked at some of the negatives. What are the positives that are going to come out of the last 12 months? What are, what are, what are the good things that are going to happen? I think there's aspects of community spirit that's been good. Um, I, I've seen it in my own local neighbourhood where people are helping each other out. I mean, I've deliver some food parcels to the elderly and vulnerable and leave it on their doorstep and people are checking on each other. Um, in a bizarre way, um, friendships have been strengthened. So, you know, I'm Zooming my friends all around the country all the time. Mm -hmm. So before that, people, you know, there's a group of great pals of mine from university. We've known each other for, for 30 years. And we wouldn't pick up the phone very often. We'd meet up two or three times a year. But now we're Zooming each other once a week. So mm -hmm. it, bizarrely, the ties that bind at the moment feel fragile in terms of tactile behavior and giving each other a hug and traveling to see someone. But in some ways they've been strengthened because I think people have taken a step back going, my God, I need to hug someone or I need to see someone. Thank God for aspects of technology to bring us together and we can at least chat via Zoom or whatever. And I think what could come out of this, and I feel this with a number of different things. I love playing sport. Um, and I can't wait till we, I can again. And I think possibly an appreciation of the simple things in life that we took for granted and have been stripped away from us, when we get them back, we might appreciate them. But the other thing I would say, and this is, this is how I'd like to finish off, one day all of this will pass. Um, hopefully it will pass when we get towards the end of the roadmap, but we have to make sure that every single freedom that's been taken away from us, from us during this crisis, we have to get them all back. Wow. That's we very can't, powerful. We can't. And I agree with that. That is, we need to actually document each and every one of the freedoms that has been taken away from society, and we need to get them back. It is the moral responsibility of the government to do so, um, and uh, most of the public would expect that. Um, but I agree. I think it's very easy to lose our freedoms, but sometimes it can become a little bit more difficult getting them back. But we have to make sure that we do. Well, you're a modern William Wallace, and uh, <laughs> you know, uh, basically, don't worry, I'm not the brave heart, the brave heart of our times. I'm not going to invade York or anything like that. No, 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 don't worry. Don't worry. I'm don't a lot worry. more moderate than that. Yeah, yeah. No, but I mean, his call for freedom was 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 a call that was uh, is still heard around the world, and was an, an amazing freedom fighter. Yeah, but he looked a bit cooler than me. He was uh, arguing freedom with a broadsword and a kilt, and I'm doing it on a keyboard. Yeah, well, you don't know. I mean, they, they use Mel Gibson in the movie. Who knows? You know, you may be more... Well, he was you, too short for the role. He was yeah, too anyway. short for the role. He was a tall guy. But uh, listen, James, it's been an absolute pleasure, and thank you so much. Do please follow us on Camelot uh, TV. On the uh, There's the little link there. Thanks, John. And uh, we, will, we will see you soon. And do come back to Camelot again soon. Well, and do. My pleasure. Thank you.
Thank mm-hmm. you.